go back to where we were. We had two weeks, uh, two weeks and a few days okay. where nobody was gathered as us. Um, and all the people that I knew that came um, uh, with a positive, uh, Mac and Sandy Brockington, uh, did not get it here because they weren't here. And, and we weren't here. Well, Sandy was here the same way that Sandra was. She was, uh, and then, but then she got it. She was tested later that week. Yeah. Okay, because I talked to her Monday of this week, and she was tested positive Friday last week. So we'd already been out for 10 days. Yeah. So, uh, and I sat and I've, I've chatted with a couple of places and trying to think, how could you have a connection even though you saw them, or did she see anybody else in her life? Okay, uh, and I'm not sure they're doing the contact tracing and trying to figure out wherever you've been. But I'm not sure how accurate. Uh, certainly, maybe every bit of information is helpful, but gosh, I'm not sure you can just 100% say that this is definitively where it came from. So we try to be careful. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, if we're going to come back for worship, we need to come back. We're going to come back for all of them. They also told us, because when Dad first, when we got his results, I ran down to get my test. And they said, no, wait at least five days from his first symptoms because I could get a false negative reading and actually have it. Uh -huh. So I waited a few more days. But she told us last week when they released us, when our time was up, um, I asked her about retesting, and she said, no, she said, because you'll test positive. She said, you carry that virus for like up to 60 days. She said, but after the 10 days, you're not contagious anymore. Oh, okay. So. Well, you, you learn something different or more every time you turn around uh, between the TV, the media, the CDC, between somebody who's got it, between somebody who supposedly knows um, uh, I just uh, uh, I just think we need to be in, in the right way we need to be we need to be doing those things that God has got for us um, and not letting this virus become a source of, of uh, limiting fear of that Certainly, it can be guidance that can be watching us, but not, it, it can't be. It can't become a fear that, that is overpowering us. So I just, I just don't think that's. I don't think it's going to be good for us. So, but we want to pray for all the people who have it. Mac, uh, uh, I talked to his um, uh, son Ron yesterday, and he was still doing real well. Um, he'd been sitting up. Uh, he's on a little bit of oxygen, but not as anywhere near as bad as it had been. Uh, but keep praying for Mac. Mac is, uh, uh, gosh, he's got so many different things. He's he's compromised all over the place, uh, and so we want to make sure that uh, uh, we don't forget him, Sandy, uh, even even the ones who had it to make sure they come out. I haven't talked to Bill and Roland for uh, since I guess Friday. I talked to him, and they were doing. They were doing okay, and they were supposed to be out of their 10-day or whatever it was over the weekend. I talked to him yesterday, and both of them were not feeling that well yesterday. Okay. So I didn't want to continue to call, so I was going to call tomorrow, but he, he went. Both of them were not feeling good yesterday. Okay. Well, the problem is, is that some of these people, that, that could be the day. You know, there's days I'm just not feeling too well, mm -hmm. and it has nothing to do with, you know, the day before or the day before. So um, we definitely just keep keep being keep being careful, praying and trusting um, that uh, that God's got this and that He what He's working to do and how we are involved in that will become clear to us. Anyone else we need to uh, 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 homecoming on the eleventh. Uh, we will have uh, the service here. Uh, Dwight Eastler is going to be here preaching. His family will be here. We will not have a meal. Uh, we Right now, it's just no meal. If later, as we move through the, the holiday season, uh, something 
gives us encouragement that a meal would be uh, uh, beneficial and, and appreciated and attended, then we can do it and call it whatever we want. Uh, but certainly we can, uh, we'll wait till then. Uh, I don't know if anything is going to change between now and whenever. We have no vaccine. You get a vaccine, it's made. Well, then they're going to have to distribute it. Uh, I want somebody else to take it first. Um, uh, I'll be careful. I'm not going to. I'm Lynn had noticed that she's, she just told everybody at their church that she's been part of a, a experiment thing that they're doing. Yeah, giving it up at Chapel Hill or somewhere up there. Uh -huh. Well, that's fine. Somebody, I'm glad yeah, somebody's doing it so they can figure it out, and that's good. Uh, my dad told me when they ever come out with a new uh, model of a vehicle, uh, you always wait six months before you buy it. All right. So, uh, but we definitely want to pray for that uh, as what we're doing. Any other prayer requests we've got, Jay? All recipients and missionaries. Yeah. Somebody's spoken. Anyone else? Jim. Francis's sister and two nephews are leaving uh, Hewlettville area into Arkansas Thursday or Friday. I'll let like Fred with me. And my children and grandchildren. All right. Everybody else doing okay pretty much? Pray for our world. I was talking to somebody today. I don't, I don't, I don't even remember who it was. But uh, uh, just all of the things that you are seeing between the COVID, between the riots, between the politics, between the between everything that's happening, it, it, it just making it more and more and more clear to me how sad and sinful our world has become and how much it needs a message of, of hope as evidenced in a life of love. Uh, they, gosh, they, they say that weddings and funerals are some of the best times to share the gospel. Uh, and certainly in our society today, it's got to be one of the best times uh, for people to be open to the gospel because there's so much hate and anger and hopelessness everywhere you look, everywhere you look. And fear is overtaking uh, the world. It's, it, it's infiltrating the church. Um, and not just fear of COVID, just fear. Just fear. And as believers, we're, we're not supposed to fear. We can be concerned. We can be aware. We're not supposed to worry. Fear is just an, a, uh, an exaggeration of worry. Um, we can be careful. Uh, but, uh, but those things, uh, uh, we, we've got to cling tighter to God. Uh, it sounds easy. It is. It's just practice. It's not, it's not always as easy as we'd like. So. All right. Well, it, We've got these to pray for uh, our nation and all those other needs, but certainly let's uh, continue to pray uh, first and foremost, and uh, even through the week as God brings these and other uh, concerns to your minds. But let's pray now. Father, we, we acknowledge the, uh, as much as we can understand, Lord, the place where we're at and the, the difficulties and the concerns and, Lord, the fears and the, the lack of hope uh, Lord, people are grasping it uh, at, at more uh, extreme, more far out, more unusual solutions to the uh, to the things that are rising up in uh, in their minds and their lives. Lord, as they see them, and uh, they're not going to find answers in any of those things. Lord, uh, the answers to all our needs are found in. Christ Jesus and a relationship with him before God. So Lord, I pray that you'd help us to, to live our faith uh, and be bold to share the truth, Lord, that uh, our faith is grounded on, Lord, that it's built on, that it's sustained by, Lord, that uh, we 
would be your messengers uh, to, uh, to a confused and needy world. But Lord, for these we've mentioned, uh, uh, with the shut-ins and missionaries, Lord, for those who have been tested positive for uh, the virus, for family members to travel, and move, all of those things, Lord, and the unspoken as well. Lord, we pray that, uh, Lord, we certainly pray for the things and the results that we would consider to be good, Lord, for healing, for strength, for answers, for guidance, for wisdom, just for discernment, uh, Lord, for peace. Uh, uh, in, a, in a crazy time. But Lord, uh, we want to as well acknowledge that uh, we, we don't understand what all of those things may look like, Lord, even in our own lives. And so we pray that you, Lord, would work your will over those things that we ask. And Lord, help us as we pray, Lord, as we pray for others, as we pray for ourselves, as we pray for those good things, Lord, and right things. Help us, Lord, to... Uh, Help us to know better how to pray. Help us to be more effective uh, in what we pray for. And Lord, help us to always be quick to give you the glory. Lord, even before we see how you will respond, Lord, because we know that you will respond uh, as we pray in faith believing. And Lord, that you will work your will. And that is what is best and right more than anything, Lord, we may imagine or desire. But Lord, strengthen us where, uh, where we don't have a good vision, where we don't understand, and Lord, where we may sometimes ask amiss. Lord, that our faith wouldn't be in our own desires, but it would be, uh, our faith would be in you, who have already proved how much you love us, and Lord, how uh, good you are, and how good you are to us. So Lord, just guide us in all that we do. Help us to, uh, to desire you, but, Lord, not just to know you, but, Lord, also to serve you as we walk in obedience. In thy name we pray. Amen. And that's a good segue into tonight. We're talking about serving. Uh, you've, I gave you the sheets from last week, even, or, yeah, the last week that we did on the video, but, uh, uh uh, I wanted to make sure that those were out. Uh, I gave you that sheet that had some other ones. If you're missing one, uh, let me know. I've got the sheets. I can always uh, print those off for you. But we'll talk about service tonight. And, and service, I got there. Not every act of service should be considered as part of a spiritual discipline. But only those acts which train a person away from sin can be part of a spiritual discipline. Now, there's a, there's a, a general sense that uh, everything we do uh, under God's calling in accordance and obedience to His Word uh, could be something that draws us closer to Him and, and in essence, would be leading us away from sin. But, uh, but, but that's not exactly what we're talking about. Uh, you know, some things we do... Uh, we can do them more casually. We do them more regularly. Uh, we do them uh, with the mindset that's different than we may have when we're discussing or uh, considering uh, service as a spiritual discipline. Okay, remember what 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 are the what's the purpose of a spiritual discipline? To, to, to do the spiritual disciplines, to be engaged in spiritual disciplines. What? I, I can see all the eyeballs, but I, I'm not here now. I'm sorry. I'm, am I not paying attention? What do you think it is? Don't, don't, don't try to look back and find my answer. Find what do you think. For us to mature as Christians. Okay. To mature as Christians. All right. So how do we, how do we mature as Christians? Because I know how I mature in life, right? I get older. Okay. But now that's just getting older. Is, is getting older? Or just time itself, the same as maturity? No, it's growing. Hmm? Growing. Okay, okay. But now I grew because what I was and where I'm at, I've grown a lot. And my brother, my oldest brother, he grew even more than that. He was taller than I was. But he wasn't very mature. He, uh, bless his heart, he, uh, 
And you know how I mean that. You know, you know, bless, bless your heart has got two different ways. And context is, is so important. But, but just looking at the eyes and hearing the voice, you can tell which way it goes. That's right. He's, he's that way. Um, but, uh, but, but that's true. It, it's, it's the idea is that, that you grow and you mature. But now, for me, growing up and maturing, uh, in, in a, just a physical sense, right, a world sense, uh, maturity is what? Being able to, uh, uh, to deal with life and to function on my own and to provide for myself and make some kind of worthy contribution, maybe. Those are things to mature. Get along with others. I remember when they used to have on your report cards uh, way back a little box that they would check if you play well with others. You remember that? Some of y'all aren't, aren't old enough for that. That's back where y'all aren't there we yet. Didn't, we didn't have that. You didn't have that? We didn't have that. They didn't, <laughs> they didn't count that there. They didn't count that. Well, where I was, it must have been more needy because they counted if you played well with others. Uh, uh, you got a check or a star or something for that. But, but, but what we're talking about, about maturing or growing, is spiritual. Okay? Now, basically, as a, as a baby, you, you keep feeding the baby and, and taking decent care of your child, your child's going to do what? Grow. It's going to grow. And the opportunity for maturity is there. And they'll mature some. Okay? My oldest brother, he, he was mature in some ways. Uh, eh, okay. Other ways, he was, was not real mature at all. And it was two or three ways that he surprised you once in a while, and he actually acted like he knew what he was talking about. Okay? But in spiritual maturity, is it it's the same thing? If you if you take a, a, a new cre a new Christian, uh, feed them the word and basically take care of them, are they going to automatically grow? I think they comprehend some of it, but I don't know that they might not grow as much as you would think they would. All right, now that's two different things. Mm -hmm. Grow and then grow as much as you think. So they're not they're not the same thing. What does it mean to grow where you apply what you learn? Okay, okay. Because that's wisdom. See, wisdom is learning and doing for good. All right, not for bad, for good, for God's glory. Learning and doing, that's wisdom. That's where wisdom comes from. All right. Not sure what the world thinks anymore. They used to think some of those things. Uh, uh, of course, they didn't get they didn't get it right. They didn't have God in there. But uh, uh, but there's something to that that we 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 learn and we grow and we apply that to our lives. I would say that any Christian who who has fed the word and basically halfway taken care of, okay, in an environment with a family, okay, of God. They're going to grow some. Are they going to mature just because that automatically? I would say no. You're not going to mature. Because maturity takes effort. It takes intentionality on our part. Because um, um, is salvation conditional or unconditional? And it could be considered a trick question, so think about it. Salvation is a gift. Is it conditional or unconditional? I say it's unconditional. It's unconditional because God loves everybody and He doesn't give this one or that one salvation and not another one. Uh, we all have that opportunity for salvation. Okay, you're saying different things. Okay. Okay. He loves everybody. She's on the fence, buddy. <laughs> no, no, I think I think she's firm on one side. But, sure where you're going. <laughs> but this is this is a privacy fence. We're gonna we're gonna tear that down and put a chain link. Okay. Uh, God loves everybody. Everybody agrees that, right? He loves everybody the same. Okay. Now make sure that's clear. Okay. Because salvation and then those things you said are not necessarily wrong. Salvation is conditional. And why would I say, huh? We have sinner. 
<laughs> we'll say the same thing, just because you, because you have to choose, right? Because you have to choose. Isn't that kind of like head knowledge and heart knowledge? Uh, yeah, you know, I've, I've gotten to where I'm not as, not as fond of head and heart quite as much because we tend to confuse them all the time. Uh, it's, and I've said before, Scripture uses heart sometimes where, where we really ought to be thinking head. Uh, uh, it's just the translations. But, uh, but yeah, we choose. Now, uh, does that mean I can wait any time I want and choose? And I have it. No, you've got to be live. Bingo. I love that, right? Uh, uh, you've got to have conviction. Because you will not truly inside in a way that leads to salvation understand the depth of your sin and repent and confess it unless you are convicted. Does that make sense? Alright, you go, well I don't know Brother Will. Well tell me how many people choose to lose weight in the first week of January. But they have not quite that same conviction just a little bit later. When I sold a lot of guard, we sold exercise. I always loved the first couple of several weeks to a month or so. Because if you could get in and sell your exercise, then you had the best chance that right after the, the right after the first of the year, okay, uh, just a week or so into sometimes through February, but not much into March. Depends on where you lived. And the reason was is because all those people who felt bad started, but after about six, seven, eight weeks, a lot of those people are selling that stuff and then they can buy them used instead of buying new. All that exercise equipment, right? So, so we've got to make sure that there's a difference, okay? So conviction comes at what? God sends conviction. God chooses how we are convicted. He chooses when we are convicted. And he chooses how often we are convicted. Right? That's a matter of God's grace. Right? Does he have to convict us every day? Does he have to come to us every day? Does he have to come to us uh, knowing that we're going to say something and, and do it right before we, we say it so that we'll get saved on our deathbeds? No. No. No, we have no, no right, no earnings, no of ourselves, no expectation for grace. No guarantee. No guarantee. No right or no guarantee. Maybe the best two ways to say it. Okay? Because you can't do something for it and you really should expect it. Alright? God's grace is, is what he freely gives, yes. But it, it is something there. So, so, so the idea that uh, 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 it, it's conditional, okay, uh, and conditional is doing something. But maturing and being spiritually mature is also conditional, okay? Now, we'll mature as we'll grow older. But remember, Paul was upset with the Corinthians. Why? At that one point, he says, oh, you've been Christians long enough that you should be eating meat deeper spiritual truths. Instead, you're, you're just baby talk, okay? Why? Well, because that's all that you've dived deep and you can't do it, all right? It's like saying a little kid has still got their water wings on their elbows, except they have a long beard too. Why? Well, because they're old, but they're still just paddling on the top with water wings. Now, if you can't swim, I'm sorry, all right? I'm not trying to be all swimmy. What is it? Swimmobia? Or swim challenge, I don't know. But the idea is, is that so so the spiritual disciplines, they move us where we are intentionally working to seek more of God, to know Him better spiritually. And service can be a way where we are not, not just doing things, okay, but that we are aiming at that goal and doing those things. Does that make sense? Right? If I'm just not feeling too good and, and, uh, 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 and I lose a pound, right? Weigh myself and I lost a pound. Oh, well. 
Well, that who cares? You're not really trying. It's just no big deal. That, that, that you just didn't eat or you ate that, or you know that's what how it worked out. But if you're actually trying to lose weight, well, then that would be kind of nice to, to see see the benefit and and the, the the purpose of what you're doing. So service where we're we're going to be looking is things that we're going to be doing with that goal in mind. So sometimes it may look like the same thing. But if you don't have the goal in mind, it's not exactly the same thing. What's a road trip? Anybody ever gone on a road trip? All right, Jigger, what's a road trip? Well, it depends on where I want to go. I'll either go from here to the beach or I'll go from here to the state of Washington. So you're going someplace, right? So you've got a purpose. you got a goal. And you are going to go there. Well, what's just going out for a Sunday drive? What's that? Going to get a thing of ice cream. <laughs> no, no, that's still got purpose too. That's probably better than going to Washington State. No, you just go out and you're just riding around. You're just doing it because there's no goal. Well, we're going to look at goals. So every Christian is expected to serve. No Christian is expected to live a life of idols. You know, we talk about uh, there's the Proverbs and there's places where uh, uh, I think Paul says it. Uh, he said if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat, right? What that means is, is that he is expected to be working and contributing uh, for himself, but also he says that we're, we're to work wise so that we have enough for somebody else who doesn't have enough. Alright? But you can take that same physical sort of thing and you can sort of extrapolate it over to a spiritual realm and that we are supposed to what? We are supposed to be working spiritually. Okay, it improves us and provides for our growth, but it also helps for somebody else. Because we help encourage by our example. We help encourage by our words. We help encourage by the challenge. You know, sometimes the guy in the back of the pack, he doesn't care if everybody leaves him alone. He's just sitting back there. But, but sometimes everybody runs and someone says, hey, you ever going to keep up? Maybe he'll try a little harder. It's not that he's going to be more like us, but he's going to get closer to God is what our goal is. So Hebrews 19, we're going to look at uh, Hebrews 9, 14. Uh, there's six reasons to serve, all right? You're motivated by obedience, all right? You can see the verse there, Deuteronomy, all right? Uh, you, the Lord God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your, wow, all your soul. Isn't that something like that up there? That's Matthew, but that's taken out of Deuteronomy, all right? That's what it's coming from uh, to tell us that we need to love God more, but we're motivated by obedience because God has commanded us what? To obey. I mean, sin came into the world because why? Disobedience. Disobedience. Now, they, all they had to do was one thing. Sometimes my wife gives me one thing. Get the ice cream. Okay, now that I always, I'm pretty good with, okay? All right, we've been motivated by gratitude. Is gratitude a good motivation for things? It, it, the sense of gratitude, is that a good emotion? Is that a justifiable, profitable, beneficial emotion? Okay, we have one, sure. The rest of you are waiting to see what I do with that, okay? Why? Hmm? It shows your thankfulness. Your... Did I, I, I want to talk about gratefulness or thankfulness? No, you said gratitude. So. Are they the same or similar? Similar. Okay. I agree. Yeah, we ought to be grateful. It, it, it's understanding what God has done for us that makes us grateful, that makes us what? Appreciate and love Him more because we realize that He didn't need to. We didn't deserve it. All right? No right, no guarantee, but he still did it, okay? Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 12. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart, right? For consider what great things he has done for you. Man, you know, they, they say that if you're feeling depressed or discouraged or down, just start thinking about people who are in, in worse situations than you. You know, sometimes we can think of our sins as the worst of anybody's, right? 
We can fool ourselves into thinking my sin is worse than anybody's than everybody else's. I've got more of them. I've got, they're, they're just, oh, just horrible. God will never forgive me. He'll never use me. And Satan will use that to twist us. But we're usually not so locked in that we can't imagine things being worse. We've heard stories. We know people. Uh, yeah, I had somebody tell me, what, 10, 12 years ago that, uh, that the Lord has to be coming soon because things have gotten so bad they can't hardly get worse. And my thought was, oh no, oh my goodness, no. The wickedness of man and the depravity that we can stoop to is, uh, and where we are today is, is so much evidence of that. So, uh, so there, gratitude, God has done so much for us. It could be worse and we should thank God because we do not have a right or a guarantee to those things. Remember how we were before Christ? Guilty and lost, hopeless and alone. Bad things. Motivated by gladness. Psalm 100 verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Amen. Amen. I love it when the promise keepers were big back in the, what, 80s and 90s? Uh, it seems like along in those days. And, uh, well, at least when I was uh, kind of uh, aware of them as much. And uh, they had a bumper sticker that I always loved. It says, real men love Jesus. All right? And then they had something that said, real men sing. I always wanted to get about 25 of those and then go through the church parking lot during Sunday school and just start sticking those on the back of people's bumpers. But I wouldn't like it to mine uh, just because I don't put stickers on my bumper. But, but that idea that, yeah, we sing, we come before, we serve the Lord with gladness. It's not a burden, but a privilege to sing God, serve God. And that, that's one thing that we have a problem with too. That's one reason why people don't mature is because they, they don't think about it, they're not intentional, but they don't see it as a privilege. They're, they're not motivated by gladness or even gratefulness. And they're not, they're not motivated by obedience. Uh, St. Augustine said, listen, you, you, you serve God first out of fear because He'll punish you if you don't. And then you begin to learn more and you serve God now out of the fact that it makes sense. The rules and the guidance, you can see where that's beneficial to society and mankind. Well, that's good for me to do this and not do that. And then finally, you move to the place where you serve God because you love Him. It doesn't matter what it says it is. It doesn't matter if it seems to make sense. It doesn't matter if it seems easy or hard. Gosh, are you kidding? I don't know. I don't know. I was going to say half of this. I'd love to know half of this. I don't know half a half a half a half of this like, like that to know. But I trust God. I can't worry about what that is other than trying to learn more. But let that gladness come in. Psalm 84. For day your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper, serve, read that, in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. That I, I'd, I'd rather be a doormouse. I'd rather be a doorkeeper. I'd rather work as a servant in God's house than be my own master someplace else. It's what he's saying. We're motivated by forgiveness, not guilt. Now remember, conviction and guilt, I do not believe, are the same thing. All right? My own uh, uh, new, new, uh, new glimpse of, of a word of, of truth and theology, right? Uh, it's not new I made it up, but it's new I think I see it here. Uh, but guilt, the purpose of guilt, all right, as, as I define them, because I, I get all specific, guilt is designed to make me turn away from God. Because the focus in guilt is on what? It's on me. Remember, uh, my sins, they're worse than anybody's. Now, that's not what Paul was doing when he said, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Right? Good. I knew a woman who, at one time, was convinced she was going to hell and had no way out. Because she was so guilty of the things she had done that she said God could not forgive her. Mm -hmm. And what you were just saying there reminded me of her. 
Yeah, I would, I would, I would, I would, I've seen that uh, uh, at times, not to that extreme. I, I think we all struggle with guilt a little bit, uh, but it's a, it's a word from Satan, okay? Because his idea is to get me focused on who? Me. me. It's my sin. I'm, I'm the center of that whole world right there. Uh, and uh, whether it's good or bad, okay? He's got me there, and, 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 I, and then I'm what? Then I'm lost, and I'm hopeless. I'm too bad to what? To turn to, to God. But now conviction, on the other hand, is just the opposite. Because conviction tells me I'm wrong, all right? But it tells me I'm wrong because God has a plan, and He loves me, okay? All right? So the, so the focus of conviction isn't how bad I am. Conviction is, is that I need God's forgiveness. Okay? So, so, the, so the, the focus shifts uh, 180, and now it's not about me, but it's about God offering me forgiveness, which I need. And we don't have any doubt that we need forgiveness. So in the world, well, oh, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what sin is. I don't agree with sin. No, I don't do anything wrong. That is a lie from hell in their own mouths. Because their own lives on how they deal with other people, how they deal with themselves, how they deal with their children, proves they understand that there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. And they don't always do the right thing. We rationalize our sin away all the time. Even people who don't even want to admit to sin. So this idea that forgiveness uh, we're motivated by forgiveness because that, that's the gratefulness, right? Okay, that's the gladness. It's, it, it, it goes hand in hand. Well, I'm grateful because God forgave me. I am glad, what? That God forgave me. I've been forgiven. That's motivation enough to serve Him. Because what? Because He's proven His goodness uh, and His worth. He is good and He is worthy. Okay? So it, it, it's not just we, we, we tend to think sometimes when we pray, we pray for uh, uh, what God has done. Right? But we need to make sure that we are as willing to pray and praise the God who does those things. There's a song. Is it Laura Daigle? Uh, maybe it's Laura Daigle. Uh, he's got a song that says sometimes it, it, it's almost like we, uh, we're happier for salvation than we are the Savior. We're happier for all of these things more than we are for God. Well, why would you praise God? And if you say, well, what are the things we praise God for? All right? If you ask somebody, what are the things you're going to thank God for, we're going to praise God for, people are going to come up with stuff like, well, you know, He healed me. He saved me. You know, He gave me my, my wife or my husband and my family. Uh, you could say, he, he helped my children move from far away. I mean, that may be something that you've got to think, Okay. But maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe those are all things God does. Maybe we should just praise and be thankful for who God is. If you look at the Psalms, all right, they certainly talk about what God has done, but David talks again and again and again about what? About who God is. We say God loves us unconditionally, right? Well, why does He love us unconditionally? Not rhetorical. Why does God love us unconditionally? How can He do that? Because what Jesus did. Because He is love. Because He is love. That's just an example. He is love. So praise Him for what? For who He is. Because who He is determines what He does. And you know the clue about that is, is that who we are determines what we do. In the same way. So I'm glad my wife loves me, but that's because she is so loving and forgiving. So we want to be motivated. Isaiah 6, 7, and 8. Uh, that's where Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up. He's, he's given a, a glimpse of the throne room of heaven, but he recognizes, he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a people of unclean lips. I mean, we're sinners. We're, we're not worthy to be here. 
And then one of the seraphim flew to me and had in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. You don't have to worry about that guilt. You're forgiven. Conviction is what brings us to the awareness of our need for Christ. And part of that awareness is my sin, but also his sufficiency in all that he's done. We're motivated by humility. All right? Serve, humility, right? And, and, and we got here in John 13, the story of Jesus washing their feet. And he just got that done. And he said, do you understand what I have done to you? Make sure you listen. He said, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right before I am. And then if I, who the Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. It's that idea that, that we serve and that we're motivated by humility. Why? Well, Jesus said, I've, I've come to seek and to save. I've come to serve. All right? He came as a servant. He came humble. He came yielding up his glory to come to us. That's got to be a that's got to be a bum rap, isn't it? To come down and be like us. I'm, I'm waiting to get to heaven because it I get that idea that that was a huge thing. And if this is the bottom part of it, I want to I experience the top part. I want to see the good stuff. I want to see Jesus. We're motivated by love. Galatians 13, 5, 13. For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Now in Galatians, that these were Jews who had uh, uh, been saved, Right? And they understood uh, the salvation in, in Christ. And, and they were truly saved. But they were still uh, Jews. They were still uh, connected to that older religion. And as we see again and again in Paul, we have the Judaizers who, who come in to all those places where Paul left. They would come in and then start messing everybody's mind up. And then that's one of the reasons why Paul came back or Paul came back around. Or other people were there to do that. The Spirit worked in that. But it's this idea that uh, they would say that, yeah, you, you're, you're saved, but you've got to be a Jew still. So you can be saved in Christ alone, but you've got to be circumcised. You can't eat meat uh, offered to idols, no blood. You, you've got to do the feast days and this kind of stuff. It's one of the reasons that Paul uh, came back to Jerusalem and had the big council with uh, with Peter and James and, and the rest of the apostles that were there, we see uh, about halfway through Acts where Peter says, no, nah, Peter, you're wrong. When you were with me, you sat with the Gentiles who were believers and you had no trouble. Back here among all the other Jews, now you're all of a sudden starting to act like the old guys. You can't do that. Well, the Galatians were doing that. So he says, you, listen, don't, don't use your freedom, that you're free in Christ as an opportunity to just do whatever you want because some people were saying, listen, I'm saved. I'm, I can live any, any way I want. I'm going to heaven. Amen. How many believers do you think we have? Or how many... Uh, let me rephrase that. How many people do you think are in the church, members, who think that very same thing? Oh, I, I, I did some BBS or, well, I'm a member of that church, so I'm saved. I can live however I want. Why? Because I'm going to heaven. Amen. Amen. Somewhere in my back wallet, wallet or my purse, I've got my little get out of hell free card, right? Well, no. No, you don't. Paul says, don't, don't do that. That's not, that's not how you do it. That's not true freedom. And if you think that, you're not really truly free, most likely. But, but instead, serve through love, serve one another. Well, every Christian uh, is called to serve. Okay, now, let me make sure I, I, it's expected to serve. Expected and called. You understand what that really is, don't you? When you're expected home or you're called to come home, what, what, what's another way to describe that, that thing? Think about it. When you stood this tall and you were told you can go out and play, but you're expected to be back home at what time? What were you really getting from your parent? No, that's what you show if you do it. It's a command. It's a command. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but my dad, he said, I, I, when I was expected to do something, oh, 
choice? What are you talking about choice? There's no choice. There's no suggestion. My dad didn't hardly suggest anything in his life. Not to me. Not to me. He says, uh, yeah, that'd be good. It's the same thing as get it done. All right? Well, that's fine. That's fine. But this idea that, uh, that, that, uh, that we're expected, we are called to serve, it's a command to serve, right? It's not a, it's not a suggestion, okay? It, it's, not a, it, it's not just one option. Yeah. Like, like the sign said, the Ten Commandments, they're yeah. commandments, not suggestions. Yeah. But we, we, like to, we like to think of it that way. Why? That when, when we do that, okay, we've got it. Backwards. Because now, who gets to choose? Who determines whether it's uh, uh, authoritative for me or required? Well, then I do. But no, we can't do that. But every gift, every Christian is gifted to serve. Okay? Now, this doesn't sound like a command, but I'm thinking it is. Right? It's the same thing. We're expected to serve, but we're also prepared to serve. And and you're not prepared to serve or get to serve so that you can think about it. I think it was Paul in the New Testament said uh, reasonable service. Yeah. Yeah, well. That's uh, what it's expected of. Yeah. The, the idea of worship, uh, uh, living sacrifices, uh, uh, that whole thing, you know, were changed. Uh, the idea that we are expected and, and reasonable. Are, what, how much is our reasonable service? What do you think? That's not what I got on here, but we can, we can talk about something else. What about reason on service? Based on what on the other side of that thing, what God's done for you. Well, I, I, I'm not sure I want to go that way. That's not true. Because I, I can't do that. I can't match that. I can't keep up with that. That's right, but that's, that should be your government. Yeah, but how about this way? How about making it easier on me? Nope. And think about not so much what he's already done, but think about it this way, what he's called me to. See, because what he's called me and Ken and Gina to aren't the same, not the same thing, and he may not even be the same amount or types of service, but you're faithful when you do what he's called you to do. Does that make more sense? Yeah, but it's uh, like he expects us to do that till he calls us home. Well, yeah, but but not but don't, but remember what he's called you to is not generic. It's specific to you, not even believers, not even the church, but to you, Gina. And that's how faithful we are in that calling and that service that we give. That's the well done, good and faithful. Remember, because they didn't have the same amount of talents, did they? All right, they had different amounts of talents, uh, but they all what used them obediently, and they served. And so that's where it comes from. Uh, so, because the master had more talent than that, he didn't give them all to those three. He just gave some, because uh, everybody would get some as we go out. But so we're gifted to serve. So we see spiritual gifts. You, every Christian has at least one spiritual gift. It's not a natural talent. They may overlap in some ways, but they're not the same. All right, because uh, there's a lot of people who uh, who have abilities just inherent, but it's not a spiritual gift. Uh, in the idea, because the spiritual gifts are given to us, why? God's Lord. Okay, well, that's the ultimate. What's the purpose for our spiritual gifts? What does Scripture say? To do good works. Do His work, whatever. <clears throat> Second one's closer, but more specific. No, that's not it. First Corinthians, I think it's 12 and 15. They've got some stuff. Y'all read those and look at that. Colossians. The idea of spiritual gifts, <laughs> they're given to us, Scripture says, for the edification of the body. Okay? Now, we can use them in this, and of course evangelism as a spiritual gift, 
shares it out, but it's to build up the body. All right? But that includes making the body bigger. All right? So it includes those things, but it's also stronger. But what I want you to understand is it, it, it's not to go out and make disciples. Okay? It's the edification of the body. That includes those things, but it includes other things. Sometimes when we, when we try to uh, uh, define the, uh, the forest by the individual trees, we miss the fact that there's a forest there, right? Okay? When you go and they talk about the sequoia groves, all right, the redwood groves out in California, we went to Yosemite National Park and uh, uh, the Mariposa, I think is the name of the one, uh, and, and it's these uh, redwoods, and they're unbelievable. They are unbelievable. All right? You drive your car through? Huh? Did you drive your vehicle through the tree? No, I, I think that one tree, I don't even know if you could do that or if it wasn't where I was. Um, they, uh, they don't do that stuff anymore. They don't cut those holes in them. They don't because it, it kills the tree. Um, like looking at the side of a house? A big house. Okay? Because I've actually stood on the ground in the dirt with a sequoia and my arms or like this, okay? I can, I can get away from Sandra around that tree. I mean, I can get away, uh, and they're huge. But, but that's not the only tree there. There was all kind of other trees, oak trees, pine trees, uh, elm, birch. Uh, there was everything out there in those woods, and so we want to make sure that we understand it. That, that we're doing this for the body, uh, we use them in and out, right, to increase the body, but that's the purpose of those things. That's, that's that main goal of, of those things. And, and serving is often hard work. Colossians 1.29, For this I toil, struggling with all uh, energy that he powerfully works within me. All right, Paul saying, listen, uh, the job I've got, the service that I'm called to, I'm working as hard as I can. When you see the word strive, when you see the word labor, okay, uh, and the idea that it was a, a great labor or heavy labor, uh, those are English words trying to, to, to get a, a, a Greek or a Hebrew impression of you are straining with every sinew and breath and ounce and everything you have, right? It's the guy who's just crossing the finish line on a marathon. He has given everything he had in those 26, whatever it is, 0 0.2 miles, okay? And, and here at the end, he, he is still to the very tape and through he's given everything. That's that feeling. John 3, 4, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me to accomplish his work, right? Because Jesus was tired and he was hungry. Yet he said, listen, man does not live by bread alone, but by what? By every word that proceeds from the mouth. He said there's things more than this is work. I, I, I deny these needs and urges that I have. Why? Because I'm doing God's work, and it is sometimes work. Anybody ever get tired serving the Lord? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Sometimes I, 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 I've been talking about, I, I quit saying tired for a while and I started saying weary. Because weary sounds a little more highfalutin. <laughs> it just means that I'm, I'm tired and tired. It doesn't sound as hard to God. Huh? It doesn't sound as hard towards God. Oh, yeah, yeah, true. Uh, but, and weary, we can be weary. I don't want to be weary of being weary. Uh, and I don't want to be weary to the point that I give up. I don't want to, I, I'm not sure that a Christian should ever get to the point that they would acknowledge or be aware that they are burned out. Because that, that gives the implication toward God that you didn't give me enough to do what I need. Uh, and what that really means is, is I didn't take what you gave me, I used what I had. Uh, that's at least in my life. So, and it's not in vain. This service, is, it, it's not in vain. First uh, Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. Therefore, my beloved brothers, what? Be steadfast in movables, always abounding in the work. Another servant of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. 
Now, what's the, that last phrase? Knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. What's the key phrase? What's the key point in that last part of that verse? In vain. No. In the Lord. In the Lord. In the Lord. Yeah. Because you and I, we're going to do stuff uh, uh, and uh, uh, all through our lives. We're going to do things. We're going to be serving. We're going to be engaged. We're going to be accidentally on purpose, surprise. I wasn't trying to, but God, you know, and then we get to heaven and we're going to see how all those things were not in vain. But I won't know here for most of it. But in the Lord, that's a different thing. Okay? Those phrases like that, those are so, so important because it, 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 it frames the whole uh, uh, conversation. Remember? Whether I'm serving for me or I'm serving for God. Okay? Where, where it's making my life easier or better in any way. Or whether it's to, to, to fulfill God's purpose for which he called me. Uh, and Hebrews 6.10, we'll finish with this. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work. And the love that you had shown for his name in serving who? Saints. In serving the saints. As you still do. Yeah, it, it's, it's saying, listen, you, uh, God, he's not going to miss what you do on his behalf. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. There's a, there's a story of a, a missionary. He'd been overseas for 40 years and he uh, had been and he was retiring and he was coming back to the states and it was the time that they would uh, be on uh, uh, on the steamships and stuff the boats and so he had come back and and uh, they're pulling into New York City okay New York City and uh, there are the big docks and stuff and uh, and there where they're coming into the pier there's all these balloons and bunting and stuff and people are there have got a band and they're cheering and he's coming up and he's thinking oh my goodness oh my goodness and it turns out to be for some famous person, the president, or somebody that, that they were welcoming off the boat. All right? And he's sitting there thinking, well, good grief, Lord. I served you for 40 years faithfully. And, and he said, there's nobody here to welcome me. And then a voice came to him and said, well, well son, you're not home yet. Okay? So, so God isn't going to greet you at the end of your active. Well, let me take that back because that's not exactly true. God won't greet us in a way that we would imagine he would if we quit doing some things. But he'll greet us when we're supposedly, when we are finally done and we go home. He'll step us there because we're not supposed to stop until we what? Until we're with him. That's like when uh, we used to go out at my grandfather. He was a preacher. And we'd go to his house up in North Florida and had a lake right down the bottom of the hill. You crawl through the barbed wire fence. You walk across Dodge and Sand Spurs and a few cactus. And you get down there and there's a lake. It was, oh, we loved swimming in that lake. Loved it. Loved it. We, we did a lot of stuff for that. But Grandpa had a deal. He'd come up and he'd say, I've got this little yard thing it was a little dolly out of like a wheelbarrow sort of thing and had a couple of wheels and we could push it and drag it around we were big enough for that and he'd give us a little uh, uh, like a mini uh, show but it had times you know okay and he'd say okay now you walk around the yard and you pick up all the uh, uh, Spanish moss on little branches where they'd fallen down and when you find those little cactus you dig the whole cactus up. Don't you pull it off the top because it'll grow back up. Okay, just just pull, dig it up a little bit, and then and use it and put it in that bucket. And and when you get enough, then then you can come, you can go, uh, be done for the day. And after lunch and your obligatory uh, uh, thirty minute right because you can't touch the water for thirty minutes uh, after you eat. I'm not sure how you drink without drowning, but you uh, you got to do that before you can go swim in the lake. Well, we're out there thinking, all right. I'm done. I've got a pretty good pile here in this little hopper thing, and, and I'm ready to go. It's getting close to lunchtime. I could go and relax a little bit and play outside. And, and uh, that I'm thinking uh, somebody's got to tell me it's time because I'm done, right? 
And if we had left that thing sitting someplace and wandered off someplace without that worth and grandfather, we'd have been out there all afternoon. No, but he would come out and tell us, now it's time. And once he told us, then we rested. And it's the same way with God. If we are faithful and serving with the goal that it's going to bring us spiritual growth and closer to God, that's when it's a spiritual discipline. And that's the purpose. I would think we should, for all our service, we ought to have that Mindset. We ought to have that thought. I'm trying to be more like Christ. I'm trying to be closer to God. Let's pray. Father, you, you have called us to yourself, but Lord, you've called us to serve you. To know you is to love you, and to love you, Lord, is to obey. And so I pray that you would help us to, to understand that better uh, as we look at your word, but Lord, also as we experience our lives. And Lord, the opportunities that, that we have to do both, to know you, but also to serve you. Lord, as we look at those who have gone before uh, and those who are even now doing that around us, Lord, I, I get excited looking at some of the people we have who, uh, who are in their 80s and Lord, even up into the mid-90s and still have a desire and a passion for you. They don't do as much but Lord, but what they do is still about you. And Lord, that's, that's what I long for. So, so let that encourage us and challenge us. And Lord, let us be more faithful. Lord, let us be more obedient. Lord, it would be because we love you more in a way like you love us. Watch over us and guide us. In my name we pray. Amen.